said to me, Richard, is you wanted to talk about how lay people, whether we had anything to say about how lay people can keep their practice going uh, in the midst of uh, not being uh, monks and so forth. Um, you know, the, that's a hard question to answer from my perspective for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that the three of us are not lay people in the common sense of it, you know. We each of us spent many years in monastic practice, and Richard, I don't, again don't know anything really about Paul, but Richard and I have both practiced in the Ningwapa and uh, the uh, tradition that's non-monastic, but I wouldn't call it a lay tradition at all. You know, people who, um, I mean, he, he taught whatever he needed, uh, as we've talked about before. Uh, he, his public teachings were about monastic practice and being a junior monk for lay people. But uh, my experience with him at a private level was he never made distinctions like that. Uh, it was just, here's the Dharma, do it. And uh, the question is, how do you do it, you know? Yeah, I think that uh, Chukwu is very much misunderstood because uh, he was a real tantric master if you really got his teaching, you know, a full-on tantric. He was a master of everything. It didn't matter what it was. <laughs> yeah, but a lot of people think of him as a very strict uh, Vinaya master, you know, that, you know, but there was a lot of, a lot of things going on beneath the surface of things that are very obvious if you took a little time to think about them. That were very tantric, even when we were monks at Gold Mountain. Absolutely, so. you know. I, I, I'm sorry. I, go ahead, I Paul. I agree with that. For example, you know, I considered him as, as a Chan master, but I never saw him practice Chan. He he practiced Mijung. That's what he was always doing. He was always doing the forty-two hands. That's the only thing I ever saw him. Yeah. So I, I agree with you in the sense that. He was, yeah, he was Vajrayana in, a, in many ways. That was where he was at. Yeah. You know, when I left monastic life, I went off. I didn't, for various reasons, I had nothing to do with the community for 17 years. And then I started having some dreams. He was in my dreams and stuff. And I got in touch with him and I went out to see him and I spent a few months out there and, and came away with about the same reaction I had long years before. But <laughs> One of those dreams I had was um, was Shirfu. Uh, I had this sudden, uh, in these kind of dreams, I don't remember if it was a dream or if it was a meditation. I'm pretty sure it was a dream where there were a group of people doing, like dancing around a maypole almost, you know, like a traditional English maypole. And Shirfu was there. And he had on one of those Vajrayana hats, you know, like the like the Karmapa wears and things like that. And he was doing something with his hands and so forth. And he looked over to me and he said, when like he said, Don't do that again. <laughs> Which was like I took it to me and you took off and uh, don't do that again. And I went out to see him shortly yeah. thereafter. But the point was that it was a, a it was a total tantric type ritual. And he, he was there as a tantra master, and and I had you know, and that kind of solidified something. My own thinking was that just as Paul said, he did everything. When you're an awakened being, it, you know, there's no these are no distinctions like that. Distinctions about being a chan master or a vinaya master or are all from the perspective of people who haven't woken up yet, like me. Um, and so we can differentiate him into different things but he you know i spent as we all did i spent a lot of time with him one-on-one -on -one, and he was just 
you, you couldn't possibly categorize him other than this guy's awake and knows what's going on, and I don't. Uh, yeah, but, that, um, that's exactly it. What you just said is exactly it. He knows what's going on, and I don't. And that's the, that captures the reason that uh, the practice of charm, it doesn't work sitting facing a wall unless you've got your under the guidance of a real charm master and awakened. Absolutely. I have to tell you, I never understood what Chan was about from the get-go, and I still don't. Uh, it was baffling to me what the hell we were trying to do. I started the, f the first summer session I went to, which was, hmm, was that 1969, I think. It was the second summer session. Uh, I was trying to learn how to sit in full lotus, and it was killing. I mean, it was the most painful experience I ever had in my life. And what I started doing is I started memorizing the Dabe Joe, and I was like, okay, I'm going to do the first five sentences, and then I'll run across my legs. And I spent months reciting the Dabe Joe and using it as a timing mechanism to learn how to sit. And by the time I really could sit, which was many, many months later, that's all I did. And that was really my main practice for most of, the, most of my life, really, uh, when I was in Hong Kong. Uh, oh, you know, it's funny. I told you, that, Richard, when we talked before, that I spent several hours reciting Adabe Joe seven times. That wasn't correct. It was 108 times. But it was still several hours. It was very, very, very slow. And I had all kinds of samadhi experiences and interesting experiences, and listening to the birds outside and figuring out what they were saying and stuff. But to me, he was, I mean, if anything, he was a mantra, uh, you know, mantra. Uh, master, I guess. Yeah, um, that's, it's called a mantra. A, a mantra. A a mantra, yeah. A mantra. A mantra, um, a mantra. So, uh, you know, I think in terms of what, how people should practice, I think it's funny because my wife, Diane, and I, we've been practitioners together for over 30 years. You know, she's a, you know her, Richard. She's a serious person. Yeah, I spent time with you. Uh, but she's also very, sorry? I spent time with you both. Yeah, yeah. She she's not here today. She had to go somewhere, but she um she's like obsessed with the changing the world and improving people. Uh, something you know, I've proven to be almost the only person who's in, who's impenetrable and uh, and cannot be changed at all. But she's still <laughs> working at it. But um um she's very social, and she joined a group of people. And I said this to Diane, and I don't think she quite gets it. There has to be this transformation at the base of consciousness. You have to become, your life has to be utterly, de, you know, devoted to Dharma. It doesn't change anything. You're still just as stupid and have all these bad habits, but it's a matter of, of being utterly focused on that. And for lay people, I think it's no different from anybody else. Uh, you know, I remember when I first met you before we worked, and we were so damn busy building buildings and doing stuff. And I was saying, you know, we don't have any time to cultivate, which I meant, you know, uh, sit in meditation. And you said, what the hell's wrong with you, basically? Uh, you know, it's up to you. If you're if you're cultivating, it doesn't matter what you do. And if you're not cultivating, you can sit there all day long, and it's completely meaningless. And, and he's 100% right. And this, I think, it doesn't matter if you're a lay person or you're a monk or whatever you are. This is the crucial issue. If you really, really get it, then you get it. And every day, whatever the hell you do, that is practice, cultivation, as you say, as you say in the Chinese tradition. And if you don't, you can just spend all day long saying mantras and doing ceremonies and maintaining the vinya. And none of that's a waste, you know. It's all really important, but that's not the core of it. And I've tried to, when I first came back from Hong Kong, this was in, I don't know, 1976, I think. You know, people who knew my background, say, oh, you should be a teacher. You and I said, I don't think so. Uh, you know, I'm barely a student, how much less anything else. And that's the problem is that I think a great many people are focused on these externals, on on being a Buddhist, in a sense, uh, and, and um, they uh, objectify, if I had anything objectify, to... objectify Buddhism. They make out of Buddhism a thing. 
thing. They make it into a thing. And so for lay people, I think it's no different from anyone else. You have to first get that core transformation of your life and then a commitment to proceed on that basis. And then you discover you're just as hopeless as you were before. Uh, you know, and it's a, a constant struggle. For, I don't know what you think, Paul. You're sitting here listening to me babble. Well, I'm just, I, I'm I'm curious. Uh, it seems to me like you're, you're talking like a, a born again experience of some, you know, I'm referring to my own background here. And uh, I don't see why it would have to be that way. I don't see how, why you couldn't uh, practice this or that and even another religion and, uh, and eventually uh, come into the, the, what we call cultivation. You know, it would, I don't, I don't see it as there's, oh, there's this bang where it, it gets planted. If it's if there, it's been there for a long time. Many who knows how long it's been there, and it will it will, given the right conditions, it's it's going to sprout, and then it then then you'll be there. It's not really a beginning; it's just a continuation. That's how I see it. You know, uh, I, 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 speaking about the lay practice, I'm a good example because when I left the monastery, I stopped completely. For 20 years, I didn't meditate. Oh my God! I completely was I was just done, and then I, uh, I, I couldn't. I couldn't, I couldn't I, do that. It started again. It just started I, back up again. It I, was. I it was. Uh, it was. Be I couldn't do that. I couldn't do that. Before I met the master, for four years, I was meditating eight hours, ten hours a day. While I was with the master, I was, and I am now. It, I've never let up because I think once you get really plugged in and that enthusiasm is there. I remember once I said to Sherpa, because I don't have any skill like Hong Cho does, none, zero. But I went up to the Sherpa one day because I was in TM and I was meditating all day and I went to Sherpa and I said, Sherpa, you know, I don't have any experiences, but so somehow I'm just so interested and I don't know what I'm interested in, but I sit there and I just so interested in the sitting. And uh, I don't know what it is in my mind. And uh, Churchill looked at me and he said, that's the way it is, you know. So I think mm -hmm. that, you know, it cannot be forced. It's got to be coming in. Watch you there. You know, it's pulled yeah. like a magnet, you know. You know, like years before I met Sherfu, you know, when I was a late teen, I remember I worked in a shopping center mowing lawns. I was so enthusiastic to meditate after work that I would lock myself in with the lawnmower and the whackers and the uh, <clears throat> and I'd meditate for two hours before even getting to my place, you know, and I think you, you have to have that enthusiasm. Now, when we talk about Chan, Chan meditation, you're sitting there facing the wall. Now, that can work, under, but there's a condition you have to be un under the guidance of an enlightened master. Otherwise, Chan is, is what's important. You know, that's what's so, you know, precious. And, you know, I gave a lecture in uh, the Buddha Hall one night when everybody was kind of sitting like really stiff. And I just, I just lectured on what I call beauty queen meditation. It's where you kind of, <laughs> you, know, you, you, you know, like a beauty queen in front of the mirror and she's admiring how beautiful she is, you know? And I, I was saying, you know, you can sit in a meditative state and just like look at your mind and think that's your mind and you think you're being so still and you think your breath is going so smoothly and you think your mantra is just right on target. You know, it's like a beauty queen. She's thinking her eyelashes are looking so good. Her cheeks are so perfect. And, you know, it can't be like that. You've got to lo really lose yourself go way beyond that. Then that's, that's charm. I can, I can remember Shifu walking around you know, the hall uh, when we were doing that kind of meditation with this big grin on his face. <laughs> like, okay, this is cool. Here's all the beauty queens. <laughs> <laughs> but he knew damn well that we weren't doing anything. But it was better than all things we could be doing. So it was not terrible. Uh, you know, but it's interesting what, what Paul just said, because once I learned the Dabe Joe, when I left monastic life, if I did it would it was always running 
deep inside. I would hear the mantra all by itself, you're doing its own thing. And so it gradually surfaced. Uh, I, you know, I, when I was working as an attorney in the city and commuting from upstate, I, I had a long train ride. And I would just sit there and the mantra would just appear and I'd start, you know, keep, I would like join in. <laughs> I didn't, it was already going. It's like the tape was already running. But I don't and that's know. what it was I like think, with me when I, when I started meditating again. It was like I never stopped. It was just you know, right. I didn't have to relearn anything. It just, I did the I did the Huato, and that was my dharma all the time. I was with Shifu. What was Huato it? Made, I didn't hear that. made sense to me. It really uh, worked for me. I could feel it. Like well, like I learned a, to read Chinese like, in about eight months. You know, it wasn't like learning it; it was remembering it. It just came to me, and I'm not. People think I'm good at languages. I'm not. I was good at Chinese. That's it. You know, it just. I, I'd look up words, and I knew them already. And, and within, you know, less than a year, I was reading, and another year, I I started translating, which was a big mistake because I didn't know what the hell I was doing. But um, say la vie, as I say. But you know, obviously, what you were saying, Paul, is true. We all have these deep roots, and again. You know, Richard said he wanted to talk about if we can offer anything to lay people about how to practice. But I don't I don't see that as a a real differentiation. You either are a practitioner or you're not. And yeah. whether I, you shave your head and keep the vinia, monastic vinia, or you are uh, have a long beard and hair and, and drink beer with your dinner, it doesn't make any difference in the in the ultimate sense. It makes, obviously, it makes a difference in the conditioned world. If you can't control your behavior and so forth, you're going to find yourself in trouble karmically. But that's at a much more superficial level than real practice. You know, real well, practice is at a much deeper level. So I, I think that uh, you're misunderstanding a little bit about uh, my motivation. I, I agree with you that, you know, and in fact, it's one of the things that I I often think about is like there's nothing about a, a monk or a lay person that has any any advantage in practice. What I'm talking about is I think it's important because lay people a lot of times think because they're lay people they can't practice like a monk or like practice really deeply and. You don't, you find just the opposite with monks, and that's a real hindrance because, of course, the monk thinks just the opposite because he's got his robes on, he's an automatic practitioner, and he doesn't do anything worthwhile, you know, unless he's a really good monk. I think there's a lot of that. I agree with you. Yeah. So, as a lay person, what I always advise is minimum amount of minutes. But consistently, day by day, it never miss. Have Absolutely. Time. Don't overdo it, and you'll get hooked on your own by just being consistent. You know. And well, what I tell people who are really asking me these questions seriously is that number one, I'm not a teacher; they should understand that. But I'm reasonably experienced as a practitioner, not particularly good at it, but been working at it. And that what's most important is exactly what you just said. Find something you like doing. It doesn't matter what it is. There are a million practices. Find something you're going to consistently do, even if it's, like you said, 10, 15 minutes a day. If it's meditation, if it's lighting incense and bowing, if it's, uh, you know, mantra recitation, if it's niem for, it doesn't matter in the, in the long term. What's most important is to make that deep connection with practice. And I tell people that a lot. There's no such thing as the best practice, the most important practice. It, it doesn't exist. You know, it, I, I've said to people, there are 84,000 Dharma doors, which means there's a Dharma door for every single individual. But what they don't realize is when you pass through the Dharma door and you turn around, it's not there anymore. There are no Dharma doors. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's an illusion. Analogy. That's a great analogy. Yeah, it's not there. You turn around and, oh, this is a different place. And and so it doesn't matter how you get through a Dharma door. Just find one. Because uh, they all open into the same place. 
and there's no once you're there, there's no more doors. Uh, and that's hard for people to understand and grasp because for most of us, it's so easy to grasp at the externals, at the symbols. And I'm a Buddhist, I'm a disciple of this teacher, or I do this practice. And certainly compared with doing nothing, that's, a, that's great. It's really, really important. But you have to go beyond that into, into uh, there, is no, there is no dharma, there is no practice. It's just entering into the state of ultimate reality. Diane and I had this conversation last night. And I don't know, she tells me that what I'm saying makes no sense whatsoever. I, I, maybe that's true. Uh, but um, I think maybe she isn't quite hearing what I'm saying. But I, I 100% agree with you that the most important thing is some level of consistency. Yeah. What you're doing is almost secondary. Yeah, exactly. What do you think? Paul? I mean, I don't know that much about you, you Paul. I just, Richard explained to me that, um, you know, some of your background, you did a, a, a long term Biguan, which is, I, you know, I would have killed somebody if I didn't do that. Well, I did it in Hong Kong, but it was a different kind of situation. Uh, so I, I was, you know, I, I sold. I don't know. I, I did. I memorized the Sarangama because I knew Shifu wouldn't let me go into seclusion and just meditate, which is what I really wanted to do. Right. So, yeah. But so I would go. So every day was exactly the same. I, I, I sat down for five hours. I didn't move for five hours. Then I recited. And then at the end of the day, I sat again another five hours. So I did those 10 hours of meditation every day. Went to five in the morning, five in the after and in, in the evening. And then I did, I worked on the on the sutra the rest of the time. But I was not, I don't think I think if I were to be honest, I would guess that you guys are way ahead of me in cultivation. But I have to say, <laughs> I wouldn't uh, guess that. <laughs> uh, you might be able to help me with it. You, you've you've been involved in Namkai Norbu's. He what Namkai Namkai Norbu did for me, he did in a matter of fifteen seconds when I met yeah. him, because I was I was verklempt about <laughs> the fact that I left Shifu. Yeah, and he just. But he he said, I, I I didn't even get to finish my question before he said, he just said to me, he's always going to be your teacher. And then a thing came back to me. Yeah. Just this just this autumn, last year in the autumn, and bang, my whole practice went up another level, just like that. Yeah. So was, know, that was a seed that I that he gave me. I'm you, really plant the seed, it. you plant the seed and you wait for it to mature, you know. Some people, you know, they hear one thing and they wake up immediately. Well, it's not because they never thought about it before. It's uh, it's that they've had many lives of practice. And, and uh, it's like I was listening to this woman yesterday that Diane was talking with, who doesn't believe in future and past lives and blah, blah, blah. And I thought to myself, what is it you think Buddhism is? I mean, you can explain Buddhist ideas without using rebirth. I, you know, okay, but but it's a fundamental. It's fundamental to really understand it, uh, how the whole thing works. But that's what it is. I accept, don't be attached. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. And I don't really talk. I mean, I'm willing to talk about this sort of thing with the two of you because you're serious practitioners who understand some things aren't to be discussed beyond certain circumstances, but uh, that's not the sort of thing I talk about. I've talked with Diane a little bit about it. She's a skeptic. She she believes the problem is that she's able, like most people, to come up with alternative explanations. Okay, that's fine. I don't care. You know, uh, I have no need to convince anyone of anything, but I know what's true in those circumstances and what isn't. Yeah. That's how it is. So I don't. I would say I don't. I'm probably a lot like Diane and being a skeptic. Only thing is, once you've been with somebody like Shufu, you know there's something more than the material. Yeah. You know, once you've been with Shufu, you can't 
you know, you have to be open to all that stuff. I mean, one of, one of my issues, frankly, I, I, you know, I, I had a dream, a very long detailed dream with him while he was in the womb getting ready to be reborn to this world again. And he sort of was checking me out to see if I was still on board, which I was. But I, you know, I still have a real open question about monastic life as opposed to the Dzogchen uh, uh, ascetic, uh, you know, lay ascetic, if you will, which I find more more attractive. It may be just because I'm too lazy to be a monk, but um, you know, I'm going to do what he, you know, I'm going to find him again next time around. And if being a monk is what I need to do, then I will. But I'm not utterly convinced that's the most useful approach. I think, it, you know, if you look at the uh, Gandavyuha, the last chapter of the Avatapsi Sutra, the first of the 55 teachers, although actually if you count them carefully, they end up with 57, but, uh, the first of them is a monk who's not living in a monastery, he's living on top of a mountain. And after that, I think there's one other monk, but it's all... Lay, lay people, if you will. It's practitioners and it's goddesses. And it's uh, one of them is uh, is a Hindu god, Maheshvara. And, and in other words, it's a much broader scope of of, rec of thinking about practice. And he always told me to study the Avatamska. I mean, there wasn't any question from the beginning. And I... I for a long time, I read the whole thing every year. I read it about 40 times, maybe. A few years ago, I stopped doing that. Or I just actually gotten back to it recently. Uh, I read through the whole basic commentary. I read his whole in commentary. Chinese. In, Chinese, in Chinese, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, well, that's the only language it's in. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's interesting. The uh, commentary. So, to that I, you mentioned, about. you mentioned, Fred, that you came back to visit after having left. Yeah. Yeah. Did you come to the city of ten thousand Buddhas? Yes, I did. So, and you found it not to your taste. It was funny because what happened was, um, uh, my my marriage was falling apart. It was my first marriage. I'm, this is my second marriage now. And other things were kind of disintegrating in my life, and I had, I had, I started having dreams about him, uh, and they're not about him; they're dreams with him in them. You know, it's like basically, what the fuck are you doing, kid? <laughs> and uh, so I called him up uh, out of the blue, and he wasn't available. And Hung Sure got on the phone and arranged for me to talk with him for a couple of days later, and I got on the phone with him. And I said, oh, if I have a question that I really need to go through with. He said, so, he, or what he said, <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> the first thing he said to me, it's 17 years since I'd seen him. He said, what are you calling me for? I'm not dead yet. I thought that was really funny. <laughs> Do and you I remember said, well, what I, year that was, Fred? Yeah, I can tell you. It's probably, uh, let me think for a second. I'd have to nail it down. I could, but it was probably 1989, 1990, something like that. It might have and been he's at the time. I'm sorry? That might have been when I was in, I don't remember you coming, and I might have been in seclusion when you came. Yeah, probably. But I, I uh, so I, so I said, he said, so you come out here, just come out here and I'll talk to you. I said, okay. So I went out to California. Now I have family in, in the Bay Area. In fact, the new, they were then had moved from the old Gold Mountain to Burlington. You can believe that if that's what you want to believe. Uh, I don't care, so, you know. So you might know this if you watched one of the, but my my relationship with Shifu was fraught. The very first words he said to me was. Why did you? What took you so long to get away from that demon king? He was referring to my previous teacher. Uh -huh. And after I tried to explain, I was that I thought I was cultivating, and I and I tried to make say good. Th I mean, I still loved the guy, the my first teacher, the demon king, the Mo Wang, and and then he said, then he just leaned back. And I was on my knees, of course. I trying to. I wanted to be. I wanted to join 
the monastery, and I thought I was a monk, you know. I wasn't far, far from the monk. And uh, he just looked me up and down. He said, well, I can see you're covered with black chief from head to foot. <laughs> really? That's how my relationship wow. with Shufu. And, and, you know, it was kind of the set the tone. And I was like Gary. I was like Hangzhou. I, I was trembling with when I was close to Shufu. See, my relationship, yeah. first time I met him, my older brother, Hung Jing, was one of the original five people of the Monks. And they were living, you know, at Waverly Place when we were still down there. And I lived in San Francisco. I lived four blocks up. I already lived in San Francisco. I lived up on Leavenworth, about four blocks up Washington Street. And my brother and sometimes some of the other people come up to my apartment to take a bath or something. So I knew about Cheerful. And I knew if I ever met him, it was going to all be over. I was, that was it. I was not going to get away from him. So it took me about a year to finally go down there. I went down to see my brother. And we were saying, you probably never saw the uh, Waverly Place. It was this god-awful, uh, you know, cold water flat on the fourth floor on Waverly Place in Chinatown. And uh, I was, there was a big, uh, like a library table in the middle. In the middle, of, it was a very tiny place in the middle of the room. And my brother, uh, I'm thinking, I were sitting there talking, and I felt this presence. You know, it's like, what the hell is going on here? And the door opened, and this huge ball of golden light walked in the room with this, like, 10-foot-tall Chinese guy inside, which he, of course, was not. And he looked at me, and he laughed, and he said something in Chinese. And uh, he and then walked into the back. And I said to my brother, what did he say? I didn't have to ask who he was. I said, what did he say? My brother looked at me very quizzically and said, what he said was, oh, so you've come. And that was my initial reaction, you know, well, that's how I met him. He never once spoke to me in English. He would he would say things to me in Chinese, and I would say, sure, well, I don't speak Chinese. And then he would look at me, and he would say in pigeon, in pigeon, oh, you no know, speak Chinese. And then he would laugh, and then go right on speaking Chinese. Uh, so I had a lot of incentive <laughs> to learn it. <laughs> But that was, you know, look, it, it's not significant. We all have different relationships with it. We all come with different karmic loads, you know. Uh, he taught everybody. I look for it. He taught all. I'm everybody, sorry? Everybody had their own relationship with the master. That's true. Yeah, absolutely. That's why I felt bad about the fact he had set up this institution and I couldn't tolerate it. And yet he said it up. It was exactly, I could not tolerate it. He set it up the way he wanted to. Oh. And I couldn't stand it. And I felt bad about that because I knew he knew what he was doing. And that's one of the reasons I stayed away when I came back from Hong Kong. That's that's a good because, thing. You know, I, yeah, I really relate to what you're saying because I always had that feeling at the Wang Fu Chung. I said, this is nuts. Why are we living this way? It just didn't make sense to me. But I stayed there for, you know, 15 years. But still, there, there was something that just, I, this can't be the way it's supposed to be. I had that feeling all the time. And when he I knew what back, he was doing, I and I tolerated as long as I could. I've often thought the first bunch of us were like, you know, the guys who jump out of the helicopter in Vietnam and set up the perimeter. <laughs> So that the yeah. heavy helicopter could bring in the, the real troops. Yeah. Yeah, and we took heavy so. losses. We took heavy losses. Every one of us left except for, <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, and then, you know, I can't get back, but in a distant way. But you know what? That was our job. That's what we were there to do, to set the thing up, yep. get it going. And then we weren't really, we were nothing but trouble in the future. So we had to get out of there. That's that's a nice way of uh, framing it. I like that. Yeah, that's a nice way. Of and so that's I've always seen it that so that way. That means I can still feel like. So I still feel like yeah, I help make the place. I help. Yeah, I absolutely. Help Shifu's Dharma like Richard way. did and you did, 
uh, when I came back from Hong Kong, Sheriff said to me, you know, look, we bought this place up in upstate, uh, upstate, up in, you know, Northern California. And uh, he said, you can just go up there. All you have to do, you can meditate and study. If you want to eat, you have to go to South Club, morning, morning recitation. He said, but you don't have to do anything else. First of all, I knew damn well that wouldn't be how it worked out. But he offered me what I wanted, you know. He said, okay, you can go do that. And I, I just didn't see it as my future, you know. I looked at the circumstances and said, this this doesn't go anywhere I want to go. And, I, you know, whether I was right or wrong is a question that's unanswerable. We do what we do, and that's it. But you did a good job. You know, the something else part is really important. You know, a lot of people leave, and the something else is not very good. At least you're something I don't know. I mean, obviously, that's yeah, not, you did, that's you not, right. you did, you that's did not true right. for you. It's not true for Paul. It's not true for me. There are some people who came to the to him and had a glancing blow. They just didn't have a deep enough connection to stay. You know, uh, there were people who came and went in the early days. You were an abbot for a while at CTB, weren't you? Me? You were Never. No, I No. Oh, Paul. Oh, Paul. Huh? I was what? I didn't hear you. Abbot. Abbot. I was an abbot, yeah. <laughs> After I got out of seclusion... You know, there was a kind of a pattern where you're elevated and then knocked down. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of people it happened to a lot of people. It happened to Han Shur. It happened to Tets. It happened to uh, Hung Ju after he did his son Bui Bai. He became the right. abbot, and then he got knocked down. It was it was Hung a Ju part was of the training, it. I think. Hung Ju. This is why I believe very very firmly, and I believe this more all the time. That that deep transformation at the base of consciousness, so, so that's what is how it's termed at the Lakavatara, but whatever you call it, it's this fundamental transformation in who you are. That you know, Diane said, Oh, it's commitment. No, it's not commitment. Commitment comes after this. After you've made that transformation, then you make the commitment. But once you've made that transformation, it does. You could end up spending your next five lifetimes into health. It doesn't. It still doesn't change that. You know, those kind of uh, of karmic problems are just that. They're karmic, and uh, unless you find a way to resolve them, you have to go through them. But it's that initial commitment to the Dharma, and uh, that to me is absolutely the crucial issue. And that anything beyond after that, if you don't get to that depth, you're just floating in, in samsara. And so you get these people who come, like I remember people coming and going. They didn't have, they, they wanted something. They came to learn to meditate or do this or do that, but they hadn't made that commitment to to to, to that transfer. You know, the the tra transformation of a person. And so they eventually drifted away again. I mean, I I, I haven't been involved in that community in 40 years, really. Uh, I went to see Sherpa and I decided the whole thing. So I decided to hell with this. I'm going to use this time to read the, this, this this text. And I spent a year or so in the, you know going just in the hospital four days, five days a month reading through the commentary, the text of the commentary, because I had been reading the sutra every, every, once a year. In the summer, I'd read one drawing a day, 80 drawings, so it would take the whole summer. And I just slowly read through it. By the time I got the end of it, I thought, you know, I think I really should start over with this. And so I had Firfu's commentary in, in, you know, in, in modern Chinese. So I read through that. That took another year or two. And somehow by the end of that, I had really, really recovered my, myself in a sense. And it's hard to say what it exactly was. But uh, in other words, if you have <clears throat> that transformation, then everything's an opportunity. I'm in the hospital basically crippled. I couldn't walk for two years. 
uh, I had to teach myself to walk again. I could only walk now with braces and canes. You know, Swami Richard, I was, I had just, I was still only using one cane and I could walk around a bit. It's gotten a lot worse, but it's an opportunity. That's all, you know, it's everything's an opportunity. That's what Trifle was telling me when I said, oh, we don't have time to call today. He said, what the hell's wrong with you? That has nothing to do with externals, you know? And I'm sure the two, I'm preaching to the choir. I'm sure you know that. But One of the problems is that you alluded to, like people in the monastery that come for a week or two weeks and go, or even come to a Chan session for a day or two and leave, is because of uh, their result rather than path or uh, motivated. So, right. like, if, if you enter the Dharma and you're result motivated, since it's a multi-lifetime path, <laughs> you're not going to last. But if you go enter the Dharma and you're path motivated, you love it just for being on the path. It's like walking up to Mount Everest. It's a long, long walk. But if you like the path, which is really incredibly beautiful, it doesn't matter if you can get to the top or not, you know. When I first, you, know, you know, it's more than that. The path has all kinds of different scenery on it. Yeah. And 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 you have uh, some parts are steep and some parts are nice and some parts got a bridge and some parts, but it's just the scenery. And I started playing again. And again, I had to struggle with it because I, I mean, I knew I already knew how to play quite well, but it was about wasting my time or blah, blah, blah. And it took many years for me to finally recognize that this is part of the magical display. It doesn't, you know, this, I mean, yeah, Scherfer was always trying to be, get, get me to play music. When I first met him, he was always trying to get me to play music. He would bring it up time and again, and I would say, I'm not doing it. So he clearly saw something about me that I didn't want to look at. And the last few years, I had a, I had a very serious case of cancer about six years ago and ended up emergency surgery. And then I spent a year on chemotherapy and it made me so sick. I can't even tell you, but during that period, I couldn't do much of anything. I tried to keep my business together, which was not so easy. I couldn't read very well. I started playing much more seriously. I started playing in music and I got back to it, and I realized, you know, my original introduction to meditation was playing music. It's a deeply contemplative experience. Uh, you know, there's a silence that underneath music that, that if you not don't play an instrument, you, ha- you may not grasp. But there's this deep, music is the interruption of silence. You know, it's the silence is there, and the music is punctuation to the silence. <laughs> punctuation to what? I didn't get that. Music is is the interruption of silence. Oh. Silence yeah. isn't the absence of it's the other way around. There's silence. There's this profound stillness, and and music interrupts that with in time and space, and yeah. and. Um, when I started really getting that, I started playing more seriously. Now I play a couple hours every day. I've been doing it now for years. What happened was I couldn't do anything else. <laughs> I was lying a bit and moan from the the, the, uh, the pain of the stuff I was taking. Chemotherapy is no joke. And it was it really... But, but right away, Actually, so, though, I think you. Me, we can let also... Me let me say one thing. Said, by the way, before we change topics, I want you to know that Paul is a, a musician too, and I believe he graduated after Shurfu to a music school and, and even taught music. Where'd you go? To you at? so what do you play? I play. I'm a keyboardist, but I don't. I don't have any talent. But I, you don't probably know this, but I wrote many songs for Shurfu and sang oh. them for him, and oh. that was kind of that was part of my fraught relation. I would write poems for him and stuff like that. And then I started writing. I wrote I what I think are some pretty successful. I wanted to get some English fun by. So I right. wrote a, an incense praise, for example, which was oh. 
just it used exactly the same as the uh, the incense praise that we do in Chinese. But I I wrote it to to my own ear and but it's very melismatic, just like the you know you sing a melisma before and after the phrase, like in that. So I did that when I did the the six uh, the ten vows of uh, Samata Bahadra. I wrote it in, in the style of, in plain chant, like a Gregorian oh. chant. And many people have said to me. Hung Chang said this to me. He thinks that was the best thing that I wrote. He really loves that one. That's fantastic. I'm not a trained musician. I started playing the guitar when I was 15. I played in rock and roll bands, and I played, uh, you know, finger picking style guitar. And that's pretty much what I still do. I, I'm basically a blues musician. And guitar mm -hmm. players are notorious for not being able to read or to read poorly. Okay. And, uh, you know, I play for myself. I, I I I played occasionally with other people and was a little surprised that it went well. <laughs> you know, uh, but it sounds like you're a much more trained musician than I am. I have I'm an amateur I do have music. training. Like I under, I can hear music and then I can write it down. That's why I did. Uh, you know, when Hung Yin was writing all those songs, she asked me because she couldn't write. She couldn't. She didn't notation, so she. I was the one that wrote out those songs so it could be published. Oh, yeah, the, oh I don't know if you ever saw the book. We did a book no. called uh, "Songs of Awakening." I have a. Couple I think I've seen, song, the, I've a seen of, the book, but I have, don't have a copy of yeah. it. You know. Yeah, I, I tried to get a copy. I don't think it's in print anymore, but because I think one or two of my own songs are in there too. But most of them are hung in, hung in so songs. I mean, I'm a half-assed you know, I, 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 what's that? I just said, you... if, if uh, Paul doesn't have a copy, or if you don't, I can probably get one for you here and send them to you, the copy to the Songs of Awakening. Yeah, if you could find one, I would love to buy one. But I went when I went to the uh, store, bookstore last time I was at Wang Fu Chang, I couldn't see, I couldn't find it. Oh, okay. They might have it, but I didn't see it. They're I just, probably just sitting for, in a pile somewhere. They're not. They're not the most organized group of people. In regards, my favorite song. Pretty yeah, good. they're pretty good in respect to books. They've got that part organized. So you're a real musician. I'm. I'm kind of a hacker. You know. But, uh, I wouldn't. Uh, as I, my my sister actually has got talent. I just love music. I'm more of a fan than. But you know, I know I I studied music theory, so I know I know that stuff. Yeah, so, I I know a fair bit of music theory. Uh, I just never really learned to read. I'm actually in the middle of learning how to read better, better, uh, uh, because uh, blues, it's notorious. Guitar players notes? are notorious. What's that? If you're playing blues, who wants notes? I mean, come on, I play blues too. And who, who I never think of notes when I play blues. I don't. I, just, I don't think of notes. Oh, yeah. Period. It's music. It's there. You, you know, you tune in and you hear it. Yeah, but um, you know, it's guys, helpful to uh, be able to read the literature. I I am come to uh, the end of my uh, allotted time here, so I want to. Oh, okay. I'm going to sign off, and it's really been great to to meet you, Fred. And thanks for yeah. Saka Sutra in a way. And uh, so I think you have uh, something for people. So don't don't neglect that. You know what I think is, I appreciate you saying that. My concern has always been that my own egotism will supersede any truth that I have to give to people. And so I, I just I didn't I keep my mouth shut. Okay. You know, I, I'm really Whatever. concerned about digging a big hole and jumping in it. <laughs> So you be right. well, Richard. It's always good to talk with you. Let's see if we can do this occasionally. Um, yeah, I'm sorry it took us long to do this. When I just moved, we sold our house away two years ago. Oh. Uh, and um, when he passed away, I did a uh, 49 day Amitabha prayer, rebirth prayer for him uh -huh. here at CTCB. And I did about two and a half hours in the morning and two hours in the evening, in the afternoon. I tell you, that prayer, and I, you know, between the two of us and whoever watches this, 
I'm not an Amitabha fan, you know, uh, that whole sutra. Right. Uh, it's not my thing, but I got so high during those prayers. <laughs> you know, like... I'm sure, you know, Pure Land practice is really a high-level practice. Yeah, if you do it, you know, you get, I got into it, which really surprised yeah. me. And, and ever... Well, even before that, I'd been doing Pure Land practices whenever somebody I know passes away, but usually for about three day minimum to a week. Uh, it's just a habit I've gotten into, but I find that I enjoy it, you know, more than my own meditation a lot of times because I don't know why. Yeah, it's, yeah. It, it's not a practice I do otherwise, but I did receive, you know who Ion Rinpoche is? Who? Ion Rinpoche. He was a Kagyu, a Nima. He was a he's a Nigma who went Kagyu and he got a big I think I've seen Kogu. his name. I think I've seen his name. A Y A N G. You might have seen his name because he was told by the 16th Karmapa that his job is to teach uh, the uh, Koa practice to Americans and Europeans all over the world, actually, and he couldn't do anything oh. else. So I received from him two. Two ten days, eight hour a day Torah uh, teaching, and uh, oh wow! So I learned that practice right from him. Then he also, I'll send you some incredible photos. That not that they're they're not incredible so much because he and I are in them, but we we hiked across the Holly Allowed Strait or Hawaii together, and when he came to Hawaii, I was his uh, guide, so to speak. So I spent a lot of personal time with him, but uh, so I know something about the poet practice from him, you right. know, uh, having received those teachings. And uh, he's quite old now. I guess he's pushing 90. And you wow. might have heard of him because he probably did a 10-day course in the in New York or somewhere around you. So that's all he does. He goes around yeah. real teaching. I'm pretty sure I've seen his name. Yeah, he's a he's a quite a quite a. I, I want to share with you like one of the most incredible feelings that I've ever witnessed. Uh, I had a friend in Los Angeles. This was not that long ago. Maybe uh, well, I guess not long ago. Things changed, and not long ago now is. Ten years ago, <laughs> but right. he got he got a cancer in the I don't know where in the colon or something. He had to have a bag outside of his body, and yeah. and and uh, you know he was given like this went on for a while, but the cancer kept growing and growing and growing, and so they gave him like two weeks to live maximum. So I happened to get the news from him. He called me in Hawaii and he says, well, I just got, you know, I got, I got the news that I'm only going to live another couple of weeks. So it just so happened at that time, it was when I was taking Ayang Rinpoche around in Hawaii with my daughter, Rachel, and, you know, showing them to the different holy places, holy places in the Haleakalau and taking them to the Kagyu temple there and whatnot. And we were up at this waterfall place on a, at a picnic table. And I was, Rachel was beside me on the opposite side. And I, on Rinpoche, and his female attendant, Becky, they were on the other side of the table. And then Becky and I, on Rinpoche, were talking amongst each other, you know. And Rachel and I were talking. And we were talking about my friend, who was a mutual friend with Rachel. And uh, so... So Rachel and I were talking, and I, uh, then I said to Rachel, I said, well, you know what, maybe, you know, maybe I am Rinpoche can, uh, you know, give us some ideas, you know, because he's a pure land teacher, what prayers, uh, his name is Sean, Sean should do. So I am Rinpoche kind of picked up on, overheard us and looked at us. And then we told him the story. And so he reaches in his, uh, in his robe, he pulls out a bag and he says, this prasad that I have, 
it's, I carry with me all the time, everywhere for the last, I don't know, 50 years or whatever. Because I always carry it. Every holy place I go, I put a little prasad from that place in the bag. And so he says, I'm going to give you a little bit of it and send, send it to him. So, I, so, of course, I take that prasad, but then, we, you know, I, everything was so much in the moment. I said to myself, you know what? I'm going to get on a plane and I'm going to tomorrow and I'm not going to mail it. I'm going to give it to him with my own hand. So yeah. I got on a plane because everything was so like happening right there it was just kind of magical. And, uh, I got rented a car at the airport, drove out to, to see Sean. And the funny thing, everything was so auspicious because there was, there was, there was these $10 deals at the airport for a rental car and they were out of cars. So they gave me this big, luxurious, big, luxurious car for 10 bucks, you know, like an SUV. It was just on the top of the line, you know. So I got this car for 10 bucks. And I went out and I saw Sean. He was in downtown LA and he had, was living with this Mexican family that took him in. And this Mexican man, uh, I don't know how he knew him. He was a gardener, I think, for Sean at some point. And he would help him change his bag. And Sean was telling me, you know, how, you know, his last days are going to be with this person and all of this and how this man is helping him change his bag and helping him move around a little bit. And the hospital was like two blocks away. And so I told Sean what I had. And I said, well, listen, this is what went down with Rachel and I in Hawaii. And this is why I'm here. So I said, I got a clean bottle of water and poured the, the, the prasad in that water. And uh, I told him to drink like a spoonful or two every day. and then. We, I took, a, we went to Shrine Lake, you went on this place, spent a really nice day or two together. We met some of his old friends and he said goodbye to them and so forth. And then I flew back to Hawaii. A week later, it was all better. A week. Completely cured. He never came back. 100%. They put the intestines <laughs> everything. Yeah. I mean, it was just totally incredible. You know, like, like I've seen healing before, but nothing like that. I mean, he was really on his way out. I mean, I physically saw him and I thought, you know, there's not a chance. And he, you know, everything was, nothing was working. Doctors were, you know, shocked, you know. I mean, he didn't have a chance. We even said goodbye to his friends together, you know. He went, yeah. he, I, I drove him around. He, 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 said, he said goodbye and everything. He could barely move off. You know, he, he was an athlete. He looked like hell, you know. He, you know, I know him from the beach and he was a great athlete. And it completely cured him. Holy. Well, one week he was all better, you know, he, everything was working. And he went on, you know, he, I don't know how, how old he was when he died, but it, it wasn't from that. It was, you know, he was, a, you know, just old age or something. That, that's incredible, huh? You know? You know, the world's a great mystery. <laughs> yeah, it is, you know. So, uh, I thought I was going to be doing rebirth prayers for him, which I had learned, but I didn't have to. <laughs> right. Yeah, I, you know, I'm convinced that I understand virtually nothing about what's going on around me. I just try to muddle my way through it. Yeah, well, there's so much going around us all the time. We don't see half of it or understand half of it, you know? Yeah. You know, it's just... Uh, it's just a magical world. I think about it all. I think about it a lot. You know who I've been studying lately? I don't know if I asked you this last time. Uh, because you went to Harvard. I, I wonder, you, did I ask you if you ever met Klein? Q-U-I-N-E? Did I? Who? Oh, Q-U-I-N-E? No, I never met him. He was at Harvard, but I, I never met him. I've been reading his stuff. I think he's an incarnation of Dharma Kirti. I really do. And he doesn't that know could it. Be. He's a very. I've read some of. I've read some of his books. He's a, a very, very thorough logic chopper. Yeah, 
he's one of these people I think that you know like he's a total materialist and he you know thinks the body is can be explained everything but you know he's just on a level you know that you know that you know sometimes it doesn't yeah, matter but, you know, there are people like that who are materialists all they need is is that little twist and they and they get it and everything else they've got is still there yeah that's true that it's true. like Diane her ability to understand people is extraordinary and to help them and help them change and she hasn't quite gotten that basic switch and maybe she will maybe she won't you know but it doesn't matter in the sense that everything else is right on target she's the real bodhisattva you know she really cares about people yeah, there's people like that that just need to, uh, you know, they're really great cultivators. And that master talked about that a lot, too. He says there's a lot of people out there in the ordinary world that, you know, you and I could practice for 10 or 15 years and not get. And, you know, Chirpu could right. say one word to it and it opens up a whole world. Did you ever, did you ever read what Thurman said about Wittgenstein? Did you ever read any of that? Who said? Robert Thurman. Oh, Thurman, no. This is incredible. Like, I was reading Thurman's PhD thesis. It's published uh, as the Central Philosophy of Tibet. He, he published it yeah. as a book. But it, Rob, Bob Thurman was in the same department I was in at Harvard. Yeah, you're very lucky. Yeah. You know him well. I, know, I think that you eat. No, you, no. I knew him off and on. Uh, I, I spent a fair amount of time around him for a while, but he, when I went to law school, he was very contemptuous of that. He said, well, oh, you're just going after the money. Huh? And, uh, you know, then I saw him in the city a few times. I, I joined the seminar he was holding, but I don't know. He's, he's a, you know, he's a brilliant guy. Anyway, one of the things that's really incredible is it, it is Dr. thesis. He says, I would never have understood Madhyamaka if I hadn't studied Wittgenstein. And then, and then in his, later in his doctor's thesis, he says, okay, like, read this part from Wittgenstein and read this part from Baba Viveka and Buddha Palita's debates that were like, what, 1200 years earlier. And he, right. juxt he juxtaposed Wittgenstein stuff and the, Buddha Palita Baba Viveka debate, and I could not tell the difference. I mean, it was almost word for word exactly what Wittgenstein was saying, what they were saying. And if you read them independently, like not knowing what that is, you would think that what Wittgenstein was saying was part of this debate. You couldn't tell any difference. But it just, shows, it just shows that Dharma is Dharma. Dharma is Dharma. Yeah. It's really true. And it's yeah, so it doesn't like matter. Possible. Yeah, I, I can't. I, you're a lot smarter than I am. I can't really get into that kind of stuff. I find it circular, which means I can't really understand it. <laughs> well, I don't understand it, but that's why I read it because I don't understand. If I read something I understand, I feel like I'm wasting my time. I read all the, yeah. all of the, you know, I like. You know, like a lot of times when I read Twine, like I, I just started reading Twine about six months ago, but pretty seriously, two or three hours a day, trying to figure out what the heck he's talking about it. And I've watched a few of his YouTube interviews, and uh, he's definitely plugged into something on a different level than all the other people in his field. Oh, he's a brilliant guy. Yeah. I read some of his books years and years and years ago. And I remember thinking this an object and from a logical point of view, that's probably what you read, right? I don't really remember. I'd have to look in my library, although I think I got rid of all those kind of books. But uh, it was a long time ago, and I remember thinking, this guy's really smart. <laughs> yeah. I'll send you a, a YouTube link. You probably won't want to watch it because it's, it's an hour and a half, but it's, it's really great because you can just see it, it's crying when, what one of the amazing things about him is he lived a long, long time. Like, and his career was, he was on top of his game for like 50 years. But there's yeah. an interview, there's an interview with four of the top 
philosophers in the United States and in Europe. Two, I think, were from Europe and two from the U.S. And Drummond was one of them, and I forget the others. And I think they did it at Harvard, the interview. He was, flying was like maybe 85 or 90, I'm not sure, but he died a few years later. And he's getting, he's getting grilled by these two, these four philosophers, you know, and they're, uh, they're an, an almost, I think it's an hour and a half or two hours. And so they're all asking him questions. They're taking turns. And, you know, he is so lucid and they're asking him really tough questions. And these philosophers that are also at the top of their game, they're just looking at him in complete love and adoration. It's just, you can feel it in their eyes because they see that yeah. it's like you and I being with Tusha Grimbo, say, or Gilbert Kenzie, you know, you know he's on a different level. And to see the love, right. I watched that video a couple of times because not so much for the content of the video, but to see these philosophers, how they just just feel for him, you know, they, they see he's like a grandfather, and he's 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 so lucid, you know, like he, he doesn't miss the beat, and he answers all of these really tough questions. But it, it's a great video. I'll send you the link. Uh, okay. But I think that you know. You know, you see somebody like that or like Wittgenstein, and it doesn't matter the field. Like these people that penetrate the field of linguistics or mathematics or physics and stuff. You know, yeah. what's the difference between that and, you know, you know, memorizing the Avatomstig or something, you know? There's one difference. It's well, the same thing I keep talking about. It's that, that, that shift at the de deepest level of being. To, to a commitment to awakening. These people are brilliant people and they're not going to lose that when they finally get the truth, the scent, you know, the real kernel of it. That's how you get these people who, well, look, Paul, you know, the, the disciple Paul in the Christian tradition is an example of that. He was a totally against the Christians. He persecuted them until he had this vision of Jesus and he totally turned around and became the great founder of the Christian tradition. You know, it's, he didn't lose anything. He just had this shift in his understanding. Yeah, well, it goes back to what you were saying earlier, because it's just a little switch. So you have somebody that's like Chomsky or somebody that's in the top of their field in linguistics. And language yeah. has a lot to do with enlightenment. You know, intention, motivation is all what, where the language comes from. These people... You know, you can, you can say, oh, this is not Dharma or whatever you want. But those people, if they, when the conditions are right and they meet somebody, that person can. That's right. And that's it's it. all Dharma. It's yeah, all Dharma. It's the path. It's the path. It, it's the path. It's, uh, to me, the path is everything. You know, when I do my prayers, I don't pray for enlightenment. I just say that I keep loving the path, you know, and. And I get more, and get more clear about the path because, you know, sometimes I, you know, I doubt certain things about my path, you know, how I'm approaching the path. It, it, all my prayers every day, is, there's always a prayer to be more clear about the path itself, you know, to get the path. Yeah. You know, it's, it's so essential and, you know, being honest and truthful. And it's hard. <laughs> It's much easier to be deluded. It's easy to be deluded. Oh, my God.